Welcome, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, David Griscom. Hello, David. How's it going, brother? It's going well. And this weekend, we are doing the third and final installment of our uh, ambitious reading series. Uh, this time, the uh, 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 fourth through seventh chapters of the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. Uh, basically about, I mean, a lot of things. About how a revolution goes bad and can backslide. Uh, about the power of executives uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the role that they play in a sort of capitalist democracy, uh, which is, uh, I think, very interesting. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I realized this, like, and we, I, I'm skipping ahead to something we'll get into later chapters, but I just want to kind of tease it. Like, the way that uh, Marx describes the ability of both the Bourbon and the Orleanists faction, royalist factions, they can only coexist under a system that they're antithetical to, which is the yeah. uh, sort of Republican system where they are two different royalist factions. And uh, it's similar to how the Constitution worked in America, where you have the slave drivers, um, plantation type economy, which very much controlled the United States government. And it puts that fight that everyone is expecting to happen on complete stay in on cold ice right like, mm -hmm. it takes it takes a half a century and uh including like uh the son of one of the first presidents saying hey we should actually be able to to debate this in the senate <laughs> um <laughs> like it takes it and it's very it's a very similar sort of process there like the, the types of we talk about neoliberalism as, as the removal from economic decision making in politics well that's something capitalists have been doing kind of since they took over the joint. Yeah, and like, you know, again, for folks jumping in on this one, if you haven't seen part one and part two, I highly suggest going back um, just because I don't think we're going to be able to recap all of that stuff in, in this one. But, I mean, really, I think there's two things to think about this piece, um, both like in its moment. Um, Marx is like really trying to respond to a question why does the French proletariat not rise up in this in this moment, right? Um, you know, Marx in in a lot of ways was sort of saying that like it seemed like this you know radical proletarian workers' revolution was coming. You see all this unrest in France, and instead of building a kind of social state or a worker state, they have this incredible restoration and collapse of of the French uh, Republic, um, embodied uh, by uh, uh, Bonaparte. Um, but the other aspect of this too um, that is separate from like what he was trying to respond to at this time is this probably more than any other text of Marx um, gets closest to start breaking down what his thought is like his state theory um, and a challenge that's always laid against Marx is that like oh you know um, he doesn't really theorize um, the state um, and I think it's important to, you know, be able to look through this piece um, to, to f understand what his conception of the state was. And also to remember that, um, you know, it wasn't for a lack of trying. In fact, you know, Marx was a very ambitious writer. He wrote Capital, write a book that has changed history in a lot of ways. The intention was always to have that be a part of a series and for the next book to be the state. Um, so Marx did, you know, think that there was there was much more to state theory than I think a lot of times, you know, people sort of say, oh, it's because of like, he didn't have a conception of it. Um, I just think literally, um, he didn't have the time and capacity to work all these things out. And, you know, this is why in Marxist theory, people who sort of stayed true to Marxism, uh, without becoming revisionist, state theory becomes like one of the dominant um, aspects of 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 uh, the continuation of Marx's thought in like the 1950s and the 1960s because you start to realize as like modern capitalism starts to embed itself in society and culture um, that there is this thing um, called the state that is much more dynamic than uh, the kind of um, back of the napkin conception that like the state is is Lenin said is like the executive committee of the bourgeoisie as we see here. Um, it operates in, in, a, in a distinct fashion, oftentimes opposed to maybe the political interests of the bourgeoisie, but always with this long term goal of maintaining capitalism, protecting um, material wealth and power of, of, of certain groups. So you see that uh, very well laid out here, that even as the bourgeoisie is sort of crying um, against the despotism of, of Bonaparte, um, they're getting, you know, they're getting fed. Um, yeah. At the same time. Yeah, this will probably we'll probably be referencing this when we get to our Lenin uh, state uh, lecture and uh, uh, state and revolution. And 
But Trotsky, I think I wrote a lot about Bonapartism, or at least I saw that reference. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. um, And yeah, basically the idea that, like you mentioned, that in certain circumstances, like there's a funny section here and we have a clip to where uh, Marx uh, berates the economist, um, which (laughs) has like basically gotten detached from the political arm of the sort of uh, uh, financial bourgeois saying like, hey, you guys stop making problems for Louis Napoleon. I don't want to get. I don't want to jump again too much there, but it's very funny uh, to see Marx mm-hmm. uh, bash the Economist. Um, so yeah, I you know I feel like to ease in, uh, we'll go with a, a, another uh, historian sort of talking about this. Is this Christopher Clark? He's not a Marxist historian. Um, I don't think by any means, but um, he is a guy who I I got a free copy of his book Sleepwalkers about the lead up to the first world war and could not put it down. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a, I think a really good treatment of, uh, uh, the, uh, 1848 revolutions and how they're being talked about by, uh, historians, uh, today. But we do still worry about what happens when demands for political or economic liberty conflict with demands for social rights. Freedom of the press was all very well. The radicals of 1848 never tired of pointing out. But what was the point of a newspaper if you were too hungry to read it? The problem was captured by German radicals in the playful juxtaposition of the freedom to read, Pressefreiheit, with the freedom to feed, Fressefreiheit. <laughs> For Isaiah Berlin, that question remained one of the central questions of liberalism, the question of whether you should give someone who is both very poor and very unfree, should you give that person liberty or boots? And of course, his answer was always liberty first. But that's a liberal answer not a radical one. Hmm. The specter of pauperization had loomed over the 1840s. How was it possible that even... This is one thing I find very fascinating. Is in, in 1858, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte wrote a book, and I think he mentions it here, but the end of pauperization, right? Like, we, mm-hmm. we have to address these social problems. Uh, I mean, very redolent of today now. You'll get, like, a Republican being like, oh, I need to... Really, I really, or a centrist Democrat being like, these are the real solutions we need to like end this thing. We all agree is a huge problem. People in full time work could scarcely manage to feed themselves. Entire sectors of manufacture, weavers were the most prominent example, appeared to be engulfed by this predicament. But what did this tide of immiseration mean? What was the gaping inequality between rich and poor simply a divinely ordained feature of man's estate? as the conservatives claimed, or was it a symptom of backwardness and overregulation, as liberals claimed? Or was it something generated by the political and economic system in its current incarnation, as the radicals insisted? Conservatives looked to moral reform and charitable amelioration. Liberals looked to economic deregulation and industrial growth. But radicals were less sanguine. To them, it seemed that the entire economic order was founded upon the exploitation by the stronger of the weaker. These questions have not faded away. The problem of the working poor is today one of the hot button issues in social policy and not just in Britain. And the relationship between capitalism and social inequality is of course uh, still under scrutiny. Particularly difficult was the question of labor. What if work itself became a scarce commodity? The downturn in the business cycle in the winter and spring of 1847-48 had pushed hundreds of thousands of men and women across Europe out of work. Did citizens have the right to demand that, if necessary, labor be apportioned to them as something essential to a dignified existence? It was the effort to answer this question that produced the controversial national workshops in Paris, Ateliers Nationaux. But it was never going to be easy to persuade hardworking farmers in the Limousin, for example, to part with extra taxes in order to fund work creation schemes for men they regarded as Parisian layabouts. Here is a hostile contemporary caricature of what went on uh, at the national workshops. I find this sort of stuff really fascinating, mm-hmm. the uh, contemporary uh, art pieces of it. And, and we'll uh, wrap up after he goes through this a little bit into this painting here that Marx himself uh, commented on, which shows workers actually uh, petitioning the government. On the other hand, it was the sudden closure of the workshops, which poured 100,000 disgruntled unemployed men back onto the streets of the capital that triggered the violence of Paris's juiced June days. The Dusseldorf artist, Johann Peter Hasenkleber, captured the same issue in his brilliant canvas, Workers Before the City Council. Painted in 1849 and 
widely exhibited in a number of versions, though it shows an event, by the way, from October 1848, and widely exhibited in a number of, of versions, it shows a delegation of laborers whose work creation scheme, which involved excavation works on the various arms of the River Rhine, had just been shut down in the autumn of 1848 for lack of funds. They're seen here presenting a petition of protest to the city fathers of Dusseldorf in an opulent council chamber. Through a large window, an orator can be seen on the square addressing a raging crowd. Karl Marx loved this painting for its stark depiction of what he saw as the conflict between classes. In a rave review for the New York Tribune, he praised the artist for conveying with, and I quote, dramatic vitality. In one image, a state of affairs that a progressive writer could only hope to analyze over many pages of print. Now, I, you know, that's, that is maybe more relevant to the parts one and two of this, uh, um, but I couldn't help but share it. I've never seen that painting before, but that Me is, too. I mean, it, goosebumps um, to see the, the way it's sort of, I, like Marx is right. And, and the funny thing about this is like reading Marx and he has these very um, uh, sort of imaginative scenes that, and sort of uh, imagery he uses. Uh, and like that's sort of like when he talks about like with one painting, you've got to what I can the best I can do with words over a lot. Like you kind of understand that because, you know, you didn't have film <laughs> you didn't mm -hmm. have uh, radio programs there's only certain ways you can convey information um and you know marx does it what these with these very funny like um uh sort of parodies but yeah like that i mean what a what a painting that was but yeah right. so um as i said uh that's 18 october 1848 that painting was from um basically as we've talked about in the previous ones the uh, more uh radical uh, socialist uh, elements are dealt with after that June day's uprising by Shingarnier, who's leading the uh, National Guard. And then uh, in part two, it's mainly about how the uh, bourgeois Republicans lose control of their National Guard. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Party of Order is in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, the Party of Order made up as the uh, royalist factions that were basically fighting um, uh, for who has the right king before all of this. <laughs> and um yeah like i guess to um and, and then at the end of the uh, part two that we talked about marx is given the warning like well it's all good to get what you want but now those two party of orders are arrayed against everything again which kind of puts you back in a in a situation and where do you what sort of refuge do they have is the executive and ultimately that would be their undoing in over these uh parts too so uh maybe we play yeah, let's get into check, section chapter four here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the rise of Louis Napoleon. Um, Mid-October 1849, the National Assembly is back in session and already... Uh, oh, and so first order of business, Louis Napoleon. Uh, you know that cabinet that is stocked with all of you party of order uh, royalists? done with that i don't need that anymore mm -hmm. i got like i already used you to uh put down the bourgeois republicans and now you're on the chopping block uh and this obviously pisses off a lot of uh of uh the party of order because that is in incredibly important the executive with regards to the bureaucracy which millions of people in france depend on at this point and marx says and we won't get i don't think unless you have a section um but marx does go in at length at the importance of bureaucracy and uh why yeah go into it david yeah i mean i think it's it's worth going into it now you know this is a longer bit but i think this really does lay out like this importance here um yeah this is from like the the third fourth paragraph um Neil, he's talking about the basically, you know, these ministries that the party of order was controlling are basically being cast aside. Um, and while there were some attempts to maybe push back, um, you know, these these attempts very much like politically, at least fell upon um, deaf ears. And like within the, uh, the the contradiction of the party of order um, was that like it, it, it saw its role in the state to sort of maintain, you know, some semblance of order. Um, or peace in the French state, um, but by doing in, in doing so, uh, basically ends up you know getting themselves into uh, the kind of logical pretzel uh, later when they start uh, later when like the republic does actually start to fall. 
Um, but this, this is where Marx talks about the state and the bureaucracy, and I think it's really important. Um, the Bureau of Falu Ministry was the first and last parliamentary ministry the Bonaparte brought into being. Its dismissal forms accordingly a decisive turning point. With it, the party of order lost, never to, never to reconquer it, and indispensable power for the maintenance of the parliamentary regime, the lever of executive power. And this is like what Marx is really getting into is that over time, the parliament basically starts to give more and more and more and more power um, to the executive branch, and not just in like a kind of neutral way, right, of the, oh, the executive branch, like literally just into the control of Bonaparte. Who uses these things very well uh, to break the power of the uh, the legislative branch? It is immediately obvious that in a country like France, where the executive power commands an army of officials numbering more than half a million individuals, and therefore con constantly maintains an immense mass of interests and livelihoods in the most absolute dependence, where the state enmeshes, controls, regulates, superintends, and tutors civil society from its most comprehensive manifestations of life down to its most insignificant stirrings. From its most general mode of production to the private existence of individuals, where through the most extraordinary centralization, this parasitic body acquires a ubiquity and omniscience, um, a capacity for accelerated mobility and an elasticity which finds a counterpart only in the helpless dependence, the loose shapelessness of the actual body politic. It is obvious that in such a country, the National Assembly forfeits all real influence when it loses the command of the ministerial posts. If it does not at the same time simplify the administration of the state, reduce the army of officials as far as possible, and finally let civil society and public opinion create organs of their own independent of the governmental power. But it is precisely with the maintenance of that extensive state machine and its numerous ramifications that the material interests of the French bourgeoisie are interwoven in the closest fashion. Here it finds posts for its surplus population, and makes up in the form of state salaries for what it cannot pocket in the form of profit, interest, rents, and honorariums. On the other hand, its political interests compelled it to, da to increase daily the repressive measures and therefore the resources and the personnel of the state power, while at the same time it had to wage an uninterrupted war against public opinion and mistrustfully mutilate, cripple the independent organs of the social movement, where it did not succeed in amputating them entirely. And I put this in bold, this next bit. Thus, the French bourgeoisie was compelled by its class position to annihilate on the one hand, the vital conditions of all parliamentary power, and therefore likewise of its own, and to render irresistible, on the other hand, the executive power hostile to it. So, I mean, he's saying a few things here that I think are really critical, and this is why I think this piece is so important for looking at what Marxist theory of the state is. Like, let's just start on the economic one, right? First of all, what he's saying here is that to maintain the political power, but most importantly, the economic power of this bourgeoisie class in France, you have to have a big state to force things, you know, to create the conditions that are best for you to thrive. But yeah. by creating this large state, you weaken the parliament because that power is controlled by the executive branch. So with every benefit that you're getting maybe on the economic front, you're weakening the actual political power, the legislative power of the bourgeoisie class. On top of this, um, there becomes like an actual interest of the state, the state officials, the bureaucrats, to maintain this large state because it's their livelihoods. It's how they made, it's like how they fill their bank account. Um, it's how they influence society. So you are all, in a way like are also creating this unique class within the French bourgeoisie of people who are attached directly to the largesse of the state, um, which creates this contradiction as, as we'll get into later, as Bonaparte, um, you know, becomes, it becomes very clear that he's going to rule in an anti-democratic fashion, that he wants to break the power of parliament. You now have this split consciousness within the bourgeoisie, both from the people who directly benefit from state largesse in the sense that they're employees of the state, to the people who aren't directly in government, who get a lot of benefits from having a police force that will put down a potential strike, mm -hmm. you know, all of, all of these kind of attacks on civil society, um, you know, that helps bosses discipline labor, right? So you have this kind of split consciousness within the bourgeoisie, um, because then at the same time to develop that, you have to suppress the legislative branch, you have to dis suppress popular will, 
democracy at, at large. Um, right. So this is the kind of dual desires of this ruling class in France um, that ends up maybe amplifying, increasing the power of, you know, bosses in the bourgeoisie on the shop floor in, in society while weakening their political power. Um, and this ends up becoming like a kind of fatal flaw, a fatal mistake of, of the French, French bourgeoisie. And if, if you remember, folks, uh, you know, in part one, part two, we talked about the fracturing within the bourgeoisie between, you know, people who owned a lot of land versus people who are involved in finance. And there are all these different chapters in the story of different forms of bourgeois rule potential coming up and sort of failing or losing. Um, so, you know, we don't have time to get into all of that right now. It's the party of order, which basically makes this bargain with Bonaparte um, to, you know, create order tranquility in France um, that ends up undermining their political power, um, you know, for the benefit of increasing maybe their economic power or, or their ability to sort of rule tyrannically over the proletariat and the lumpen. And I think this seems to be like something of a, I mean, not a law, but like this is observable in empires that mm -hmm. like that this sort of repressive app, look at America. We have an entire uh, like sort of faction of sort of the, the sort of bipartisan consensus, which is all about like more military spending, uh, more cops and anti-socialism, <laughs> right? Just like um and and actually yeah, that's that's sort of that leads us into this sort of like um sort of confusion that um where everything is decried as socialist we've heard mark sort of allude to this before uh but this goes into now that the party of order has it they can't really accuse um uh louis napoleon of that here's uh, this is again from uh, socialism for all uh, who did the uh, reading on uh on uh, youtube here even bourgeois liberalism is declared socialistic, bourgeois enlightenment socialistic, bourgeois financial reform socialistic. It was socialistic to build a railway where a canal already existed, and it was socialistic to defend oneself with a cane when one was attacked with a rapier. <laughs> this was not merely a figure of speech, fashion, or party tactics. The bourgeoisie had a true insight into the fact that all the weapons it had forged against feudalism turned their points against itself, that all the means of education it had produced rebelled against its own civilization, that all the gods it had created had fallen away from it. It understood that all the so-called bourgeois liberties and organs of progress attacked and menaced its class rule at its social foundation and its political summit simultaneously, and had therefore become socialistic. In this menace and this attack, it rightly discerned the secret of socialism, whose import and tendency it judges more correctly than so-called socialism knows how to judge itself. <laughs> the latter can, accordingly, not comprehend why the bourgeoisie callously hardens its heart against it, whether it sentimentally bewails the sufferings of mankind or in Christian spirit prophesies the millennium and universal. Now, this part is always funny to me because, you know, we do hear a lot of things being described as socialism that aren't quite social, like the post office, right? We've had this discussion mm -hmm. before. But, like, I do, I've always agreed with Marx's insight here, which is, like, I understand why... Re people react against these things mm -hmm. even if they don't even if it's not sufficient even if it's not going to roll the ball to socialism or communism i understand the threat well i mean i think he he's marx is very clear here when he says that like the the bourgeoisie understood socialism sometimes even more than the socialists understood it so it's like yes it's you know it's it's goofy for example in the sense of the railway and the canal um but also you know these ideas like free speech, like these political rights, um, even though like as the, the clip from that historian we were playing at the at the top, you know, these things are often juxtaposed right between like the right to, to read versus the right to feed. Um, but also like there is the kind of socialist promise in these kind of liberal um, human civil rights um, that like I'd see today, like a lot of, of socialists sort of like turning their back on concepts like free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. Um, you know, as like, oh, bourgeois abstractions in the most like developed and, and, and competent of, of its critics. Uh, but Marx here, I think, is, is making a, a, a great point that the, the bourgeoisie at this moment in the 1840s, 1850s is starting to see, as he says, like all of the weapons that they use to break the power of feudalism are now being turned against them. Um, because, you know, these rights generally like direct themselves to like the power center. Right. So mm -hmm. like if, if a certain class is in power, well, having freedom of, of speech, freedom of assembly, all these kind of things will certainly benefit those outside of that power. 
right? Yeah. So the you know even though the yes the bourgeoisie like as, as he said something along the lines of like you know own these weapons um, against feudalism and now see them turned against themselves, right? That um, that that Marx is saying like that's a very correct class insight um, and one that I think a lot of socialists are very quick to drop just because the bourgeoisie successfully used those against the power of the aristocracy and the kings. Um, therefore, these are bourgeois weapons instead of something that has a lot of radical and revolutionary potential. Yeah, and Marx spends plenty of time in this uh, book talking mm -hmm. about the downstream negative effects that happens from that sort of re political repression um, and like, like the replacement of of better leaders by worse leaders like yeah like the, sa the same sort of thing we see with COINTEL in the <laughs> yeah. united states basically um yeah uh, here's a little bit more from that clip he bewails the sufferings of fate not comprehend why the bourgeoisie callously hardens its heart against it whether it sentimentally bewails the sufferings of mankind or in christian spirit prophesies the millennium and universal brotherly love or in humanistic style twaddles about mind education and freedom or in doctrinaire fashion invents a system for the conciliation and welfare of all classes. What the bourgeoisie did not grasp, however, was the logical conclusion that its own parliamentary regime, its political rule in general, was now also bound to meet with the general verdict of condemnation as being socialistic. As long as the rule of the bourgeois class had not been completely organized, as long as it had not acquired its pure political expression, the antagonism of the other classes likewise could not appear in its pure form. And where it did appear, it could not take the dangerous turn that transforms every struggle against the state power into a struggle against capital. If in every stirring of life in society it saw tranquility imperiled, how could it want to maintain at the head of society a regime of unrest, its own regime, the parliamentary regime, this regime that, according to the expression of one of its spokesmen, lives in struggle and by struggle. The parliamentary regime lives by discussion. How shall it forbid discussion? Every interest, every social institution is here transformed into general ideas, debated as ideas. How shall any ideas? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, basically uh, we have that situation, uh, general failure to govern and set priorities by the party of order. Uh, meanwhile, Louis Napoleon, uh, again, like, I don't want to call Marx resistance Marx. But there are certain things like after the Trump experience when he's going into Louis Napoleon as the uh, sort of grifter um, yeah. that feels like corruption politics uh, to me. But basically, like there, it's some interesting stuff like Louis Napoleon, a lot of gifts and loans hinting mm -hmm. at that. Actually, there's a secret, a, a giant store of money that we have, but we just can't use it like yet. But just wait, like put us in power. Then we'll use it like that's hilarious, um, like Trump mm -hmm. type of uh, of uh, use of funds. Uh, Marx criticizes the uh, um, sock dams yeah. um, for ec electioneering here. I don't know what you have to think about that, but basically the idea is like they're, it's not quite the field of battle at the point. And they are sort of, well, you have both Napoleon saying, yeah, fuck the Constitution. I'm going to be president again after this term. And you mm -hmm. have the party order being like, hey, we're going to do a royalist coup uh, ourselves. Like we're trying to get our own guys in there. Or maybe we'll fuse our royalists. Um like yeah, maybe and... the time isn't just a campaign on radical slogans. And then he criticized them even more for after the election, not really being about the radicalism, but being about like the column. Yeah. So there's like, there's a couple of things and I, I just want to add like one, one last thing to that, that previous section, because Marx has just a, a, a great line where he says, um, you know, now that the bourgeoisie has sort of turned their back on these ideas of liberalism and calling them all socialist, like, what are they asking for then? Well, in a lot of ways, if they are supposed to be like the political embodiment of these ideas, they're literally asking for themselves to relieve, um, relieve themselves of rule. Right. And Bonaparte takes yeah. this, this implication very seriously. You know, when the bourgeoisie basically turns his back on like on the Republican ideas, on the liberal ideas, um, then it's like, okay, well, if basically the kind of political program of, of the, of the bourgeoisie, of, of the liberals, of the Republicans, um, doesn't mean anything to y'all. Um, then yeah, it's probably time for you know for the emperor to come back into play. Um, yeah, and 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 compare this to what you were just saying, Matt. I mean, um, you know, in chapter four, there's like a couple more political events that go forward. One that becomes very important is the end of universal suffrage. Oh right? yes. So now the uh, you know because they had universal suffrage for a brief time in France, 
Um, yep. And, you know, most of part one and part two are sort of dealing with those contradictions. But now it goes away. Um, right. So you push push the workers out of politics. Um, and then as the, as the story will go on, like there's all these kind of demands and hopes from the, the bourgeoisie that maybe the workers will show up and have another revolt or revolution again. And it's like, well, we all participated in our disenfranchisement. Yeah. Um, how, can you, how can you expect that uh, to happen? But before that, as you were just saying, I mean, it's just like not being able to do politics. Right. Um, so the Social Democratic Party has a you know, I'm not exactly sure the mechanism of this, but they had somebody run for two offices offices, one in Strasbourg, I, I believe, and the other one in Paris. Um, and they win both. Um, but instead of saying, okay, well, this is a mandate for our victory and fighting, um, they say, okay, we'll just take one of these seats and we'll allow you all to have another election um, in, 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 in Paris, which they then lose. Um, so like there, you know, Marx is sort of outlining the, the, uh, you know, the weakness of the social Democrats at this, at this point and sort of recognizing that like, you know, this entire society is about to collapse. All of these rights that have been won are about to go away like that. And y'all are over here, not claiming victory when you win, you know, yeah. it, it is like, it's a tragic and ridiculous and also hilarious mistake. Um, as you go on to see, like, you don't even have to have a crystal ball, um, Bonaparte is already upending the system at this point, right? It is yeah. already beginning and it's clear that he is attempting to sort of delegitimize the, 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 the legislative branch and take power for himself. And you still have this kind of like, oh, well, procedures, you know, dictate us we do this or that. Um, yeah. you know, and I think that that kind of political naivete, um, that, that naive kind of political position, um, you know, Marx ridicules pretty <laughs> passionately in, the, in this. Yeah. Chat. There's a section later where Marx is like, yeah, this whole thing about like the coup, uh, it wasn't exactly secret. And in fact, it's been like floated for years now <laughs> and just like kind of postponed. Um, like you thought Jan 6 was like f uh, forecasted. Um, j uh, this is just like a common like thing to talk about. But yeah, here is a little bit onto that electoral law and how basically the um, the repressive uh, uh, um, removal of political rights gets turned on to. Um, the bourgeois itself. On May 8, he introduced the law by which universal suffrage was to be abolished. A residence of three years in the locality of the election to be imposed as a condition on the electors. And finally, the proof of this residence made dependent in the case of workers on a certificate from their employers. Just as the Democrats had, in revolutionary fashion, raged and agitated during the constitutional election contest, so now, when it was requisite to prove the serious nature of that victory arms in hand, did they, in constitutional fashion, preach order, majestic calm, lawful action, that is to say, blind subjection to the will of the counter-revolution, which imposed itself as the law. During the debate, the mountain put the party of order to shame by asserting, against the latter's revolutionary passion, the dispassionate attitude of the Philistine who keeps within the law, and by felling that party to earth with the fearful reproach that it was proceeding in a revolutionary manner. Even the newly elected deputies were at pains to prove by their decorous and discreet action what a misconception it was to decry them as anarchists and construe their election as a victory for revolution. On May 31st, the new electoral law went through. The Montagna contented itself with smuggling a protest into the president's pocket. The electoral law was... The Montagna, again, is that uh, what's left of the radical uh, sort of um, socialist uh, um, agitators. Socialist, and... yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they keep and they'll keep they they do make appearances here and there, like basically being called upon by the bourgeois, like come save us. It's like what you shot us in uh, June. Yeah, does. and also remember um, for people who missed part one and part two, basically like there's like multiple chapters where it's just, it's just this party of order which is destroying everyone. It's like the the classic poem about like the Holocaust, right? Um, you know, where it's basically like the party of order is the one that is sort of in a position of dominance electorally at this point but because every other kind of coalition had been stabbed destroyed and, and defeated um you know at, at this point so they're they're like one of the more powerful ones left standing but literally every other group has had their moment in the sun um and has been betrayed pretty um explicitly yeah yeah and you know um let's see here uh you know and what's interesting here is like we start off this chapter with uh, a sort of fatal weakness mm -hmm. that, uh, or or loss that the party of order has has uh, 
taken on, which is Napoleon saying, I don't need you for a cabinet no more. <laughs> and they get this big victory at the end of this, which is like, oh, we're getting rid of universal manhood suffrage. So you think they're in this party, this po um, position of power. And that's where we move into the next chapter, chapter mm -hmm. five, uh, the National Assembly versus Bonaparte. So right off the bat, there's a fight between Louis and Napoleon Bonaparte. He said, I need a more salary. Uh, you need to double that. Thank you. And uh, for some of my guys as well. And also, we need more currency up in this a bitch to get uh, uh shit moving and like also saying like we need currency because you got rid of manhood suffrage like louis napoleon's very smart and even marx like while there's a lot of people saying he's like a moron and marx himself a bit of me mediocrity like he understands the symbolism of the stuff really well so ultimately he's going to say like when he does his coup later Oh yeah, manhood, universal manhood suffrage is back. It, well, I mean, Bonaparte is like a moron in, in the sense of like developing the state and like the the grandeur of France, right? He's like an awful political leader, but he is um a, he he is a scoundrel um like through and through, and has always found ways to better his position. So like his his stupidity is maybe less so about like his his like political ability um to sort of see the the fic the fractures within french politics um and more so but like he's just like he's not a great leader of of the french system right he's he's not about to bring france into a golden age um yeah. he's about to make a lot of money for himself and his buddies um you know yeah yeah i mean we should there should really be a biopic of this guy honestly yeah. as much as like as it's much as like his uncle movie yeah that's coming out we should do yeah bonaparte would be a great one <laughs> um so you yeah there's a, a lot of great comedy on that actually like death of Stalin style be. yeah yeah exactly because it's so funny like him it, like i just imagine him observing like the royalist scheming and being like you don't you don't know how big of a gift you pussies talking about this <laughs> is to me because yeah. this whole thing of like oh i can only serve this pr one term or whatever yeah that is as imaginary as this thing that you guys can't be in power and i'm more <laughs> yeah. powerful than you um and so yeah really screaming he get, licenses this long-term coup mongering and then we get the uh society uh, oh wait did i stop playing hold on followed by an i think I, wait I, I think i got a little bit more of this to okay play. uh yeah I, I didn't mean to move on from chapter uh i should have moved on from chapter five but here's a little bit more of the end of chapter four new press law by which the revolutionary newspaper press was entirely suppressed. It had deserved its fate. The National and La Presse, two bourgeois organs, were left after this deluge as the most advanced outposts of the revolution. We have seen how during March and April, the democratic leaders had done everything to embroil the people of Paris in a sham fight. How after May 8, they did everything to restrain them from a real fight. In addition to this, we must not forget that the year 1850 was one of the most splendid years of industrial and commercial prosperity. And the Paris. Oh yeah, this is. It's interesting to note the economic cycle here, which is that like a big depression in, in like 1848, um, very uh, full employment prosperity, 1849, 1850, and then 1851, uh, we get another downturn. Proletariat was therefore fully employed, but the election law of May 31st, 1850, excluded it from any participation in political power. It cut the proletariat off from the very arena of the struggle. It threw the workers back into the position of pariahs, which they had occupied before the February Revolution. By letting themselves be led by the Democrats in the face of such an event and forgetting the revolutionary interests of their class for momentary case and comfort, they renounced the honor of being a conquering power, surrendered to their fate, proved that the defeat of June 1848 had put them out of the fight for years and that the historical process would for the present again have to go on. Yeah, so some uh, pessimism there from uh, Marx. Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically at this point, they're out of politics in, in a meaningful sense. Um, yeah. And I think that's a good line, even though it's depressing. That the, the historical the, process would, for the present, again, have to go on over their heads. I know. That's why I mentioned when Marx really good with imagery and like mm -hmm. we, we underrate how important that is for written word now because we are – inundated with stimulus and visual imagery and stuff like that but like that stuff is what you remember especially in this uh, time period um yeah but yeah so we're, we're in chapter five now um yep. so you know as you were just saying i mean basically this national assembly is elected without universal suffrage um bonaparte sees his salary increase by more than double regularly was practicing blackmail 
<laughs> right? <laughs> um, against people, true and untrue. Um, and when Bonaparte began to challenge the National Assembly, um, he would turn to the people, right? Which is very ironic, obviously, after just taking away men's uh, universal uh, right to vote for men. Um, you know, but now the people, this mass outside of politics, they don't have like a pure representative. They don't have the ability to influence politics. Well, now all they need is to have a spokesman, right? And you can speak true or untrue, but whenever he would sort of struggle with the National Assembly, he would sort of speak as he is the representative of of the people, which was a position, again, uh, given to him um, because of the party of order and other members of the assembly ruling to end the political participation of the uh, of, of, of the proletariat. Yeah. Um, and because uh, I think we had like the longer s section we have of recording, Matt, is lumpen, right? Um, right, yes. Kind of just like quick recaps from the beginning of that chapter um, is the National Assembly goes on recess again for months. And this has been a very funny aspect of of this story that basically whenever the national assembly goes on vacation <laughs> a lot of shit happens um and and bonaparte is able to get, gain more and more power and as mark said earlier you know it's basically well what happens when you don't have a you know the government in session well who's still there um bonaparte and the executive branch well they get to become the physical and political embodiment of of the state and of politics um so it only cements his his power um, and during this point, Bonaparte is scheming and then begins to organize the lumpen uh, proletariat. Yes. And that's where we get the society of the 10th of December, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of like his proud boys, <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> like they go up and down uh, campaigning with him. They call it processions, which is funny, like the royalist sort of uh, garb still there. Um, and yeah, here is uh, here's where we uh, have Marx talk about the society of December 10th, which Marx was not a fan of. <laughs> no. More or less overtly to divulge his own restoration plans and canvas votes for himself. What he's talking about here is how, like, now he can talk about his own restoration plans because the Orleanus and Bourbons uh, re legitimists are talking about theirs. So he's like, okay, I guess mm -hmm. if we're just talking about restoration, I'm going to restore myself. More or less overtly, to divulge his own restoration plans and canvas votes for himself. On these processions, which the great official monitor and the little private monitors of Bonaparte naturally had to celebrate as triumphal processions, he was constantly accompanied by persons affiliated with the Society of December 10. This society dates from the year 1849. On the pretext of founding a benevolent society, the lumpen proletariat of Paris had been organized into secret sections, each section led by Bonapartist agents, with a Bonapartist general at the head of the whole. Alongside decayed roues with dubious means of subsistence and of dubious origin, alongside ruined and adventurous offshoots of the bourgeoisie, were vagabonds, discharged soldiers, discharged jailbirds, escaped galley slaves, swindlers, mountebanks, lazzaroni, pickpockets, tricksters, gamblers, pimps, brothel keepers, porters, literati, organ grinders, rag pickers, knife grinders, tinkers, beggars. In short, the whole indefinite disintegrated mass thrown hither and thither, which the French call La Boheme. From this kindred element, Bonaparte formed the core of the Society of December 10. Now, before we get a little bit too far into that, you know, one thing I did note, and we might come into this if I can never find this text, if you're listening and you know Hal Draper's, the concept of lump and proletariat in Marx and Engels, if you have that, send it to me. Um, but one thing I did see that he mentions there is that he, he suggests that the actual translation is uh, in not lump in in terms of like potatoes, but lump in terms of like a knave, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, like, like a knave, like a rue or what, those old 18th, 19th century terms for like scoundrel, yeah. um, which I thought was interesting, but yeah, I mean, it, uh, part of me is like, I'm curious what you think about this, David, but like, it feels like there might be a little bit of Victorian, uh, morality coming in with some of this stuff here. And I'm a little bit like, I guess like in the, um, the, the, thing I do wonder is like how permeable is the layer between like lump and proletariat and proletariat. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are just two questions I have on that. Well, I mean, um, I think doing something more in depth on this in the future would be good, but like, you know, if, if I may, like, I, I think I might be a little bit more, um, amenable to, to Marx's descriptions here than, than others and, and, and yourself. Let, let me just give like the kind of the Marxist case for what he's talking about with the lump and proletariat. Um, as I understand it, um, 
you know, first of all, like here, if you notice too, like um, an interesting group in there is like the literati, right? Um, people who are interested in, in literature. And I'm no expert in 19th century French society. So I would wonder, like, for example, like with the wealth of, of that group of people, right? Um, mm -hmm. But um, regardless of, of, of like digging too deep into that, like what is the lump and proletarian and why does Marx see it as, as a problem? Um, well, there's there's a few things here. Um, one, you know, the vast majority of, of these people are people who are involved in the illicit economy, people who are stealing, um, you know, pimps, um, you know, things, things of that nature. That creates um, one attention with the entirety of society, but in a lot of ways, like the proletariat, right? Because like, who are you stealing from? Um, you know, who are the people who are bringing into you know who who, who are pimping out um, all these the, the, these kind of things? But most importantly, right? Without even getting into the the morality of, of these figures, the reason the, the, this group is such a problem for Marx is that you have to understand Marx's entire political project and idea here about politics is that class starts to form political activity, political consciousness, and then ideally political action. The lumpen proletariat, um, by its very nature, is individualized or extremely narrow set of interests, right? Where in the proletariat, um, you become a worker, right? And you might work at this particular factory or in this particular industry, but there is a kind of general sense of... Um, of like unity and political interest, like, cause if you're a worker, you want higher wages, you want more workers protections, all these things. So like you could work in one kind of factory and someone else could work in another kind of factory, but you have a similar interest. What is the, um, you know, what is the, the, the unity between a pimp and a pickpocket, right? Um, you know, maybe they want less police, right? Um, but other than that, um, you know, it's a very individualized, personal um, way of interacting with the world and interacting with society. And if you only have this kind of personal individual outlook on life, if basically your economic activity, and then in this level, uh, as, as becomes clearer later, your political activity is solely just sort of about bettering yourself and your position, you will stab the back of, of the working class, you know, in a moment, right? And as you see this, like, not all of these people get wealthy from Bonaparte, um, but a lot of them, um, you know, some of them get like very basic things like sausages, as we'll talk in a second. But some of these people get incorporated in some way or, or another into this project and are able to personally enrich themselves tremendously at the expense of political rights for workers, at the expense of political liberties for French society. Um, you know, so this is why he views them with such disdain, um, because this is a class that is very clearly motivated, even more so in a lot of ways than the bourgeoisie by like raw self-interest um, and he sees them as something that can be mobilized and utilized um, by um, by 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 an opportunist like Bonaparte and you see this regularly um, you know uh, in uh, um, in like a lot of radical and socialist movements later is that you know it is the criminal class it is the underbelly class that oftentimes allies itself with the counter-revolution with the fascists against like a workers movement against the socialist movement think about the mobs role in the American yeah. context in breaking strikes and fighting against work you know labor now you know this is like broad generalizations everyone you know Stalin robbed trains for like the the revolution right so it's not like Malcolm X yeah. you know it's not necessarily about like the content the content of your soul or anything like that if you find yourself in one of these positions but this is something that I think is 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 an important distinction to make and one that Marx does well compared to maybe you know some things that are very popular with anarchists or frankly even a lot of people in the American socialist left today what sort of valorize um you know Swindling and, and scoundrels, um, frankly, um, yeah. you know, and I think that it's important to understand that, like, um, you know, you could be against over policing of, of people and things like that, um, but also recognize that, no, like the popular movement is not necessarily going to come out of like the criminal underbelly of, 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 of any kind of society um, because they just don't have that kind of class interest that a worker does. And like this is. The last thing I'll say here is that this is one thing that I think Americans really, really struggle with. A lot of American socialists really, really struggle with is like what is class in, in Marx's um, conception, right? And we don't have enough time to like go through this like systematically. But for the most part, people think of classes like you're rich or you're poor. Right. This is very different in Marx's concept. It's how do you sustain yourself? How do you get by? And somebody who like you could be poor 
right? Um, and work in a factory, or you could be full, be poor and work as a pickpocket. Those are two very distinct classes of people. Their interests are very distinct from each other. Even though they're both in poverty, um, it's not the same kind of unifying, clarifying um, economic position um, as um, as like being a worker, being a proletariat, somebody who has to sell their labor for a wage to a capitalist to survive, right? Um, you know, and like this is a very clear historic example as to how this can be used. But I mean, I'd be down to do more on this, you know, um, but that's that, that's the basic Marxist conception as far as I understand it of, as to what the lump and proletariat is. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I think it's a very intuitive concept. And like, I think now, there's sort of like it's sort of like an anti-human response to be a proletariat, proletarian, mm -hmm. and like I think like scammers and that whole thing, a like yes, I think you would easily slot in next to all of this sort of thing, like type people making like calls to people <laughs> trying to like scam a grandmother out of like their credit card details or whatever like that, um, and yeah, I mean I think that and crypto guys also, um, and it's <laughs> yeah. not it does it's not lost on me that. Um, one of uh, Louis Napoleon's big things is we're going to do this big scheme uh, to get um, the uh, people who are just laying about around here. We're going to send them over to California and dig mm -hmm. us some gold. And it, that, that, that to me is just like the same sort of crypto thing, which is, again, like you're going to get by passively. It's not going to be it's going to mm -hmm. be by owning something because the state said you own it and you can just like accrue the benefit of that. And that's like, that's gross. <laughs> like, and, and yeah, it's not a surprise, but in, and so like that to me, it's, it's easy to understand. And like those people also like Trump, for instance, just to draw another uh, present parallel. And also like, let's just be very clear here too. Like, about like the morality of this, it. like people get thrown into all kinds of situations, right? And it's just like, you know, in a lot of ways, it's like an accident, an accident of like chance and birth, where you end up, right? If you become a factory worker, or if you become a, a knife sharpener, right? Um, or, or pickpocket or something like that. So, you know, a lot of times people get really moral about like, oh, is this group included? or Is that gr group included? And just remember, like, this is a fundamental point that, you know, we have to hit home over and over and over and over. The reason that Marx fo focuses on the working class and the proletariat is not because he thinks that they are necessarily the best or the most moral, or on the other side, the most oppressed, or the most abused members of society. There's a whole host of people um, who you can argue in, in French society and American society today, who are more abused than like the proletariat of the working class. The reason that Marx, you know, and Marxism focuses so much on the proletariat and the working class is, is not some kind of moral conception. It's like, these are the ones who are at the bottom of society, or these are the ones who have the most morality. No, it's because in their very existence, because of their class position, they have this potential to upend the system because they produce the vast majority of wealth in society that is then enjoyed by a small group of people at the very top, right? So it's like when Marx says these things, it's not some kind of, I mean, like, I think he's he's very moralistic about the lump in, don't get me wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But like, you know, sometimes people get like upset or, or feel that like, you know, the, the, the focus on um, the proletariat is, is like a moral kind of position of like, these are the best people in society. No, like a lot of people are bad. Um, you know, there's a lot of bourgeoisie who like might be like a morally good person in the general sense, right? right? Um, and there's a lot of workers who will do really bad things to you or to other folks. Um, you know, th this is not like, and it's it's tough because this is such a moral struggle to fight for socialism, things like that. But the reason there's such a focus on on this class is because, as you can see, time and time again in history, um, this is a class that like sort of can represent the most um, egalitarian and revolutionary positions um, in a way that like the lumpen are unable to do, nor are the are the bourgeoisie able to do right there's a little bit more on that uh section here on the society of the 10th of december uh lump and proletariat goons like bonaparte all its members felt the need of benefiting themselves at the expense of the laboring nation this bonaparte who constitutes himself chief of the lump and proletariat who here alone rediscovers in mass form the interests which he personally pursues who recognizes in this scum awful refuse of all classes the only class upon which he can base himself unconditionally is the real bonaparte the bonaparte sans phrase an old crafty roué he conceives the historical life of the nations and their performances of state as comedy in the most vulgar sense as a masquerade in which the grand costumes words and postures merely serve to mask the pettiest knavery yeah and the knavery again is that uh mm -hmm. very closely tied concept there um 
Yeah, and so we have this section here um, on burgers in the palace. Um, which he, again, <laughs> I just can't think of Trump with all of his fast food, but he says, um, uh, Marx writes, as a fatalist, he lived to the maxim that there are certain higher powers which a man, a particular, and particularly a soldier, cannot withstand. Amongst those powers, he reckoned first of all on cigars and champagne, cold chicken and garlic sausage. And so he began by treating the officers and junior officers to cigars and champagne, cold chicken. Basically, like he, he feeds. Gets yeah. people to, uh, his heart by feeding. He gives them nice drinks, some garlic sausage, um, <laughs> and also let's not forget too, Matt, that he's using the money that he's stealing from the state to do this too. Yes, and, it, and it's and also <laughs> this this whole burger thing becomes constitutionally important <laughs> because <laughs> it 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 Shingarnier, if you remember, was leading the National Guard um and basically helped uh, remove the National Guard from the par bourgeois Republicans into the party of order. He now Napoleon has beef with him. Because mm -hmm. and literally um <laughs> I guess sausages with him. Because soldiers kept keep doing this thing where they start cheering for Napoleon and sausages in these processions. And Shingarnier and other generals are like, we can't, we can't allow that. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, there's a, that whole th chapter. It is like incredibly historically important, but it's so fucking funny. <laughs> it would be like, I mean, you know, for lack of a better comparison, I mean, it would literally be like if sections of the U.S. mill, if Trump had gotten everybody a bunch of cheeseburgers <laughs> and we're just the... regularly being like Big Mac, you know, for, for Trump and for Big Mac, right? You know? <laughs> it's really incredible. Um, so this is why also socialists, um, when we're doing organizing, very important to have good food on the table for people because they remember. Yeah. Um, and maybe let's not effective. foreground foreground what foods we won't be will be taken from people. Yeah, um, yeah. maybe just... let's do less anti banana screens and have more <laughs> barbecues for people. Um, yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah, I know there's a, there's a lot in this chapter we're going yeah well i mean as we move so like we've got the burgers of the palace um and napoleon versus shingarnier um thing there and shingarnier eventually like kind of folds um he thinks he's he thinks he's still powerful mark says he thinks he's got this like sort of mysterious power from the bourgeois invested in him but he only has yeah. that power based on um, on napoleon himself and napoleon starts this pivot which is like hey you put we need order here and the people standing in the way of order are the party of order, uh, mm -hmm. which is like a genius move um, there. The uh, And the National Assembly is, again, like just paralyzed in it can't do anything. Um, it, it can't bring any sort of serious fights uh, to Napoleon on serious, substantial issues, instead preferring uh, petty fights. And I do have a, actually a section here. This is like and Marx has gotten into this um, a little bit before the previous section, but why certain um uh i guess uh establishments aren't really say um comfortable with calling in the people and will mm -hmm. prefer to fight on more sort of petty um let's say like procedural lines we have seen how on great and striking occasions during the months of november and december the national assembly avoided or quashed the struggle with the executive power now we see it compelled to take up the struggle on the pettiest occasions in the Mogan affair, it confirms the principle of imprisoning people's representatives for debt, but reserves the right to have it applied only to representatives obnoxious to itself and wrangles over this infamous privilege with the Minister of Justice. Instead of availing itself of the alleged murder plot to decree an inquiry into the Society of December 10 and irredeemably unmasking Bonaparte before France and Europe in his true character of chief of the Paris Lumpen proletariat, it lets the conflict be degraded to a point where the only issue between it and the Minister of the Interior is which of them has the authority to appoint and dismiss a police commissioner. <laughs> Thus, during the whole of this period, we see the party of order compelled by its equivocal position to dissipate and disintegrate its struggle with the executive power in petty jurisdictional squabbles, pedophagy, legalistic hair splitting, and delimitational disputes, and to make the most ridiculous matters of form the substance of its activity. It does not dare take up the conflict at the moment when this has significance from the standpoint of principle, when the executive power has really exposed itself and the cause of the National Assembly would be the cause of the nation. By so doing, it would give the nation its marching orders, and it fears nothing more than that the nation should move. On such occasions, it accordingly rejects the motions of the Montagna and proceeds to the order of the day. The question at issue in its large aspects, having thus been dropped, 
the executive power calmly waits for the time when it can again take up the same question on petty and insignificant <laughs> occasions. When so yeah, um, and I mean, just like the society, of December tenth. That is again like. Um, if Trump was bringing in like the three percenters or mm. proud boys to be like private security and all that the sort of like Republicans, Democrats would be like, hey, like, don't like take over the local police departments. OK, well, if you do, you know, do it this way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is like a, a classic chapter in in a kind of political perspectives weakness in the face of potential like Dem like overthrow of democracy hair splitting about oh this is the process actually you have to follow the process here um uh, instead of recognizing that this is like a massive political struggle that is trending in one direction um and basically all you're trying to do is say like bonaparte you know you can take away our rights and our political power but you got to do it this way friend you got to do it this way yeah um really i mean really hilarious and tragic um, but what's funny is this chapter you know, that like that what's interesting with that marx points out is like the procedural point they they take they take uh uh refuge behind procedure when procedure actually there's a procedure they could have followed he's very explicit that they could have put Shingarnier mm -hmm. at the in front of an army uh um and uh as the national leader of the national assembly and they didn't do it instead they'd like just ask for it and he has a section here um uh uh oh that's about the sausages um um in a uh i forget the part here but it's like basically like if you're if you're asking you've already lost like mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to assert like actually this guy has an army now um this is not about negotiation at that point and they instead decided to negotiate and that's why they eventually lost and they go back into this is where you get parliamentary cretinism um they're like going into more petty stuff and also doing uh red scare uh politics and it's like none of this none of this um matters at all and that entire time louis napoleon is playing all sides um and uh yeah ultimately um towards the end of this chapter we get this economic slowdown coming up mm -hmm. and uh which we'll get into more in the sec um second part where the economists but the economic slowdown part and louis napoleon's like okay yeah y'all are getting in the way of this and mm -hmm. uh you can't and they ultimately we aren't able to uh, withstand that sort of uh, scrutiny are we ready to talk about the lottery yeah i talk about the lottery so the lottery is such a fascinating thing and um it's it, it's an interesting like site of political power um just for comparison's sake um if people ever read uh, c van woodward's um excellent uh history of the south um, after reconstruction in, in the early 20th century the lottery in louisiana in particular too plays a massive political role um one because it is uh you know something that like you know gives people hope and i you know a way out um but two it's like an amassing of an incredible fortune that can be <laughs> directed in one way or the other and i don't know if um the uh connection in Louisiana and France is like historical, you know, because of their origins or not. But anyway, it's just like a fascinating comparison. Oh, yeah. But, you know, going going to France, um, you know, they basically put up this lottery, <laughs> which is a complete swindle all the way through, right? Um, Bonaparte is having false tickets printed. Um, it was an incredible way to distract the masses from their immiseration because there's this promise of gold. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. all of this gold is being paid for by Bonaparte basically robbing the public treasury <laughs> to fund these things. Um, and then Bonaparte and his buddies also pocket the excess. So they put up like state money to put this, you know, together. And then the money that is sort of sold that they that they get from selling all these tickets, which exceeds the lottery. Um, the excess goes into Bonaparte and his buddies in the lump in proletariat classes pockets. Um, and Bonaparte puts in control of this lottery, a very loyal police chief. Um, you know, and it's just, it's, it's just so clearly a huge scandal and a mockery of the French state and, and the French system. Um, yeah. but it's an incredible, you know, kind of, uh, circus and games, um, to sort of distract the masses from what's going on politically and economically in the country. Yeah. It's fascinating, like sort of small world thing. Cause you know, we have the San Francisco 49ers mm -hmm. are named after that 1949 gold rush. Um, and we don't hear, we don't 
in America have the concept of what a 48er is unless you have a uh, like a history background probably right but those are very linked um, and mm-hmm. to see like Napoleon per- explicitly reference like California gold as an outlet as a salve to the problems that it, like, the country's going through is just I mean it's fascinating and it's why I'm obsessed with like all the, the AI and the crypto and that sort mm-hmm. of shit um, because like it's always there's always a next big thing that's gonna like make this all work out for all of us and you know Marx and when we do the manifesto we'll spend some more time maybe on the history of it but you know the discovery in gold in, in California is a massive boon uh, to European and American capitalism at this time. It really like reinvigorates its speculation in particular and financial capital. Um, so like both in like the actual real material sense of like what's happening in European capital at this time, along with the kind of more ideological fantasy aspect where you know these like workers and in France are basically being told these glittering stories of gold from California, and they don't even have to go to America <laughs> to chase their fortune. They could just buy a ticket, um, you know, for the lottery, and they can amass yeah. incredible wealth for themselves. And of course, it's a whole scandal and a swindle. Um, God, but, yeah, depressing. You know, so you have this and like, so basically, like, I mean, the comparisons between Bonaparte and Trump, um, you know, this was a very popular one amongst socialists uh, during the Trump administration. This chapter, I think, really like this, this, this chapter in its entirety, but like this chapter of the lottery really embodies it in a way. I mean, I know Trump, Trump would have loved to do like a national American Why would lottery. Just do a lottery? Yeah. You know, like what this is exactly the kind of thing that Trump would do if he was completely unfettered. Um, especially if he could pocket a shitload of the money like Bonaparte does. Why are we um, pissing around with NFTs? We can just do a lottery. <laughs> but also think about what this does politically. So, you know, the, um, you know, th- this chapter is really about a, a bunch of fatal missteps from the National Assembly. They don't secure the military forces when they have the chance. Um, General Chardonnay, um, you know, believes that he's independent of Bonaparte and an equal to the National Assembly. Um, Basically, after this, Bonaparte wages war on Chardonnay and makes it very clear um, that, no, he's actually the top dog here. Bonaparte eventually gets his way despite some kicking and screaming from the National Assembly. So now here's what happens here. Parliament doesn't secure military forces, um, and military control ends up going to Bonaparte. Um, yep. The party of order is now without the people, without the army, and without public opinion being able to influence um, politics. And all this time, Bonaparte's out here giving people sausages and California gold, right? So he's ingratiating himself. He's sorry. He's like, you know, he's 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 becoming this, you know, larger than life figure for everyday people. It's like, well, you know, the assembly sucks, right? They took away my right to vote. Um, and this guy's giving sausages to my neighbors and like he's allowing us maybe to make a lot of money from the lottery. I mean, he's playing, yep. um, you know, as as the National Assembly basically turns their back on the people and on pu- pu- public opinion, Bonaparte is just playing it masterfully. Um, and like, frankly, in the same way that we say about Trump, if if the National Assembly was actually like delivering for everyday people during this period of time, then like the allure of like a sausage and the lottery ticket like aren't as yeah. much but it's because of the absence of like those basic bread and butter politics from the national assembly that um that uh, bonaparte is able to you know gain some favor with folks not because he's doing tremendous amounts for them but because he's doing the bear he's doing spectacle Sp- yeah. i speak for the french people here's some sausages here's a lottery ticket while the national assembly is literally just waging war on civil society i'm um, doing a lot of the dirty work of bonaparte uh, publicly um so it's a disaster. Yeah. And so that's where we move into Chapter 6, Victory of Bonaparte. Uh, basically, the expiration of the National Assembly necessitates a decision on whether to keep the Constitution or to revise it. And that question is very simple for uh, Louis Napoleon. That <laughs> shit needs to be revised because I want to be president again. And for the royalists, it brings up all of their old shit <laughs> that they have, <laughs> that they can't actually like put behind themselves because they need this sort of stasis, um, um, uh, you know, the uh, balance of powers of their constitution to really uh, make it work. So here is uh, uh, Nap- or, uh, Marx talking about some of those contradictions. If it unconstitutionally declared a simple majority vote to be binding, 
It could hope to dominate the revolution only if it's a border. This is talking about the, uh, the the party of order and the different routes so that they could take. So actually, like just really fast, just so people understand, basically what's yeah. happening right here is that um, Bonaparte wants to run for president again. Um, but the, the, basically, this is going to have to go through um, the National Assembly, and the Party of Order like can't find its way logically out of this this pickle because of those old fights that Matt was just talking about, and as it's going to be outlined here, um, you know, basically whatever decision they make undermines previous positions that they've held. Yeah, and and drives them farther apart. From, they're trying to fuse the legitimist Bourbon and the Orleanists. And it's funny, like Marx talks about, like the way they're going across the continent, you know, having these meetings and stuff like that. But every time, like, like we'll talk about it. Like they, they it, there's too many contradictions built up that the state of affairs prior was papering over. If it unconstitutionally declared a simple majority vote to be binding, it could hope to dominate the revolution only if it subordinated itself unconditionally to the sovereignty of the executive power. Then it would make Bonaparte master of the Constitution, of its revision, and of the party itself. A partial revision, which would prolong the authority of the president, would pave the way for imperial usurpation. A general revision, which would shorten the existence of the republic, would bring the dynastic claims into unavoidable conflict. For the conditions of a Bourbon and an Orleanist restoration were not only different, they were mutually exclusive. The parliamentary republic was more than the neutral territory on which the two factions of the French bourgeoisie, legitimists and Orleanists, large landed property and industry, could dwell side by side with equality of rights. It was the unavoidable condition of their common rule, the sole form of state in which their general class interest subjected to itself at the same time both the claims of their particular factions and all the remaining classes of society. As royalists, they fell back into their old antagonism, into the struggle for the supremacy of landed property or of money. And the highest expression of this antagonism, its personification, was their kings themselves, their dynasties. Hence the resistance of the party of order to the recall of the Bourbons. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that just doesn't work. Uh, Louis Napoleon is able to eventually get what he wants with regards to the Constitution. Um, and... Uh, after their attempts to try to fuse it fail um and then we get to the situation and during in the background of all this the economy is not doing well factories are closing mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, stuff not getting done and you get the uh, pages like the economist um uh let's see here um okay so here is uh the con the first time um marx gets into the economist so uh I pointed out uh, earlier after Fould's accession, Fould is a cabinet member who is basically a representative of the financial aristocracy. Um, and M Marx continues, the position of the financial aristocracy is depicted most strikingly in a quotation from its European mouthpiece, the London Economist, in its issue from 1st of February, 1851. Uh, there was this dispatch from Paris. Now we have stated from numerous quarters that France wishes above all things for repose. The president declares in his message that the legislative assembly, it is echoed from the tribune, it is asserted in the journals, it is announced from the pulpit, it is demonstrated by the sensitiveness of the public funds at the least, uh, at the least prospect of disturbance and their firmness whenever the executive power is victorious and basically says the financial aristocracy thus condemned the parliamentary battle between the party of order and the executive power as a disruption of order and celebrated every victory of the president over its own alleged representatives as a victory for order yeah and i mean basically this is like the, you know, the beginning of the end of of, of, of the system there yeah. you know, the party of order which had clamored against the socialists against the workers, against liberalism in the name of order, finds itself um, politically impotent because now all of the, 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 the financial press and the bourgeoisie in general is seeing not um, Bonaparte as the threat to order and to their profits, but rather the parliamentary system itself, right? So yeah. there becomes this distinction between the interests of the class the, of the bourgeoisie and its political representatives, um, where, where they are no longer seen as the, the true representatives of it. Um, and yeah, there's just like incredible turning on, uh, on the party of order um, after the party of order has basically turned on every other political institution and movement in the country. How closely is this situation where the 
politi- or the economic base of a party and the political base, is that kind of de-alignment? Is this sort of a de-alignment that we happen, or is that a stretch? Yeah, no, I think that you could call it de-alignment, um, right? I mean, in the, I, I think that what you actually, I mean, I think de-alignment is is is, is probably correct, and in, in in more in like in even more simply put, without putting in like modern baggage into it, I mean, basically what happens is that like the the political interests of the bourgeoisie and the financial interests of the bourgeoisie go into tension here, um, and you see what side. Um, they picked this is why, like, you know, so many of like the kind of pop understanding of fascism, for example, is that like, oh, fascism is the merging of like the government with business interests. Right. Which I think is a little bit reductive. Um, but you can see why you make this argument, because being the, the choice between financial stability and profit, um, the bourgeoisie will always pick that over political rights, always. Right. Um, and it's only these nerds like um, Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, who are, you know, clamoring <laughs> against these things, people who are politicians, people who are interested in this thing. Yes, they're in that position because they get to be representatives of, of bourgeois power in the state. Um, but the second that those that the 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 the, um, the, the, the second that supporting those political representatives contradicts with the class interests of the bourgeoisie, they're just like, hey, you know, all that shit we were talking about, the rights of man and shit, I don't give a shit. Like, how's my portfolio yeah. doing right now, friend? Um, and this is like a very early example of something we've seen in, in American and, and Western European and all across the globe of of the, the kind of progressive political um, nature of the bourgeoisie. Because remember, like the bourgeoisie delivers um, society out of feudalism. Um, you know, so in that sense, it's progressive. But you see that there is always this line that they were unwilling to cross, which is the eradication of, of their wealth and privilege for principle, right? They'll never go by yeah. principle. They'll always go by raw power and, uh, you know, economic one at that. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is where, and, you know, to name the economist, that's why the economist was like, Hey, Bolsonaro. Yeah. Bah! No, 100%, 100%. Yeah. Right. Um, well, yeah, um, exactly. I mean, like we're in Mexico, right? Like never yeah. any cries about what the pawn was doing in Mexico, right? As long as it was delivering incredible wealth and privilege for the Mexican bourgeoisie. AMLO comes in and starts democratizing the system. And it's like all of these cries about, you know, the system and democracy and liberalism, um, but not for the past 100 years of Mexican society. Did we One party rule. From these folks, <laughs> but only because some guys delivering modest gains for working class Mexicans uh, do we start to hear it, right? And it's, I mean, it's, it's a great example here of something that you see time and time again. Um, the, yeah. the aggressive alliance of of of, of liberalism and, and the bourgeoisie will be broken like that. And here is uh, he, Marx goes back in on the Economist uh, here, <laughs> calling him miserable. Still more unequivocally than in its falling out with its parliamentary representatives, the bourgeoisie displayed its wrath against its literary representatives, its own mm-hmm. press. The sentences to ruinous fines and shameless terms of imprisonment on the verdicts of bourgeois juries. For every attack of bourgeois journalists on Bonaparte's usurpationist desires, for every attempt of the press to defend the political rights of the bourgeoisie against the executive power, astonished not merely France, but all of Europe. While the parliamentary party of order, by its clamor for tranquility, as I've shown, committed itself to quiescence, while it declared the political rule of the bourgeoisie to be incompatible with the safety and existence of the bourgeoisie, by destroying with its own hands, in the struggle against the other classes of society, all the conditions for its own regime, The parliamentary regime, the extra parliamentary mass of the bourgeoisie, on the other hand, by its servility toward the president, by its vilification of parliament, by its brutal maltreatment of its own press, invited Bonaparte to suppress and annihilate its speaking and writing section, its politicians and its literati, its platform and its press, so it would then be able to pursue its private affairs with full confidence in the protection of a strong and unrestricted government. It declared unequivocally that it longed to get rid of its own political rule in order to get rid of the troubles and dangers of ruling. Mm. And this extra parliamentary bourgeoisie, which had already rebelled against the purely parliamentary and literary struggle for the rule of its own class and had betrayed the leaders of the struggle, now dares after the event to indict the proletariat for not having risen in a bloody struggle, a life and death struggle on its behalf. This bourgeoisie, which every moment sacrificed its general class interests, that is its political interests, to the narrowest and most sordid private events and demanded a similar sacrifice from its representatives 
now moans that the proletariat has sacrificed its ideal political interests to its material interests. Yeah, I just like the ri the richness of them saying, "Hey, why didn't you save us?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's it's I mean it's very delicious, and I mean I I think that this is a, a perfect um, encapsulation of 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 what Marx is getting at in this text, or even more generally of that contradiction bet contradiction between like the liberal bourgeoisie and, and and capitalism itself, is that eventually in its desire um, to maintain its power to maintain its profit. It starts to effectively ask the state, like, will you get rid of the trouble of us ruling ourselves, right? Um, it's, uh, it's 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 truly truly um, wonderful. And I, I just wanted to like highlight this um, small bit uh, that comes before that, um, where Marx writes, because like we, we you know we keep on saying that like oh the the bourgeoisie is like putting its economic interest over politics, right? Over political liberalism. What do we mean by like it's, it's, um, it's actual interest here? And Marx lays it out very clearly. All modern finance, the whole of the banking business is interwoven in the closest fashion with public credit. A part mm -hmm. of their business capital is necessarily invested and put out as at interest in quickly convertible public funds. Their deposits, the capital placed at their disposal and distributed by them among merchants and industrials are partly derived from the dividends of holders of government securities. If in every epoch, the stability of the state power signified Moses and the prophets to the entire money market and to the priests of the money market, why not all the more so today when every deluge threatens to sweep away the old states and old state debts with them? So what is he saying here? There is a direct tie between the wealth and the finance of, of, the, of the bourgeoisie in France to the state debt, to the state budget. Um, and who controls this effectively at this point? Who is the embodiment of it? It's no longer the National Assembly. Um, it's Bonaparte who represents tranquility. And it is the National Assembly that represents chaos. And this is the basic decision that the French bourgeoisie makes. Bonaparte represents stability, means that that money is always going to be there. The debts aren't going to get erased. They're not going to be threatened. And the National Assembly, by maybe coming at Bonaparte, r threatens the entirety of the executive branch and the state apparatus, um, you know, with chaos, with default, with all these things. So we're going to go with the strong leader here who's got the military and control of the state over a bunch of fancy boys in the National Assembly. Yeah. And so um, basically the the economic system or economics aren't looking good. Na Napoleon sees it's his chance to strike. Um, and he has this speech here, which is interesting uh, that Marx uh, quotes with with such unhoped for results. I'm just fine repeating how great the French Republic would become if she were allowed to follow her real interests and to reform her institutions instead of being incessantly troubled on the one side by demagogism and on the other side by monarchical uh, hallucinations and yeah basically says like the party of order is becoming a threat to uh order uh i and and does a coup in the night um, mm -hmm. um saying uh um and also along with that saying uh, i'm back and also universal manhood suffrages do you guys want to stand in the way of that that's just one final uh you know reason that you don't aren't legitimate uh peace out 100 percent. so the 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 bizarre victory of the party of order and eradicating the universal suffrage for men um ends up being in a lot of ways bonaparte's uh wedge to say look i represent the people y'all took away their, <laughs> their right to vote um and this this section ends if you're reading later it might be worth it to reorient yourself i just don't think we're, we're going to go through it this section ends with a very concise timeline yeah. of 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 this entire period i just think it will get lost in translation if we read that out um so if you're ready we can get to chapter seven yeah so i mean this is a summary chapter um uh the french bourgeois um basically marx is like the french bourgeois he ultimately chose the lumpen proletariat over the proletariat mm -hmm. um and, uh, then was, this... and then was crying to the skies where are the workers? Where where are these glorious revolutions? Remember, because don't forget, this all comes out of a mass mobilization of people, right? This entire chapter. Mm -hmm. um, this is what starts, you know, the June days, right? This incredible re revitalization of the French Republic with the proletariat, you know, marching in the streets. And now this entire movement is under threat from this despot Bonaparte. Um, and after spending the entire 
um, post period after this kind of revolution in France, um, after the bourgeoisie spent this entire period waging war on the proletariat, delegitimizing them politically, taking away their right to vote. When now Bonaparte comes for their political power, they say, where are the workers? Why are they not standing with us? Well, it's like you've demobilized them. You've taken them out of politics. And why would they fight for you? They are yeah. already under the system that is now coming for you. They've been living under it for a couple of years now because you waged war on them. Yeah, and uh, there's some there's some Mark spends a lot of time here in the early section about this Guizot guy who mm -hmm. uh uh um greeted Napoleon's coup on uh December 2nd uh, as what does he say here? Um I have the quote. Um the full the the complete and final triumph of socialism. <laughs> um <laughs> and basically like like what Marx is like what he uh why did he not rescue the bourgeois? Uh, basically like the overthrow of the bourgeois, um, particularly the Orleanist uh, financial, that was one of the original goals of the original uh, revolution. But it took all of this to actually uh, get to it. And this section here, which we lead into like uh, Marx's suggestion that Napoleon perfected the machinery of the state. Yeah. I think this is something that I've, I've seen Lenin comment on. I just think it's really important to what you said up top about like how we conceive of the state. So... Uh, here is uh, this is a little bit of a, a two and a half minute section, but uh, one of the more interesting ones here. Is it playing? It, it is right now. Executive power, with its enormous bureaucratic and military organization, with its wide ranging and ingenious state machinery, with a host of officials numbering half a million besides an army of another half million. This terrifying parasitic body, which enmeshes the body of French society and chokes all its pores, sprang up in the time of the absolute monarchy, with the decay of the feudal system, which it had helped to hasten. The seigneurial privileges of the landowners and towns became transformed into so many attributes of the state power, the feudal dignitaries into paid officials, and the motley patterns of conflicting medieval plenary powers into the regulated plan of a state authority whose work is divided and centralized as in a factory. The first French Revolution, with its task of breaking all separate local, territorial, urban, and provincial powers in order to create the civil unity of the nation, was bound to develop what the monarchy had begun, centralization, mm -hmm. but at the same time the limits, the attributes, and the agents of the governmental power. Napoleon completed the state machinery. The legitimate monarchy and the July monarchy added nothing to it but a greater division of labor, increasing at the same rate as the division of labor inside the bourgeois society created new groups of interest, and therefore new material for the state administration. Every common interest was immediately severed from the society, countered by a higher general interest, snatched from the activities of society's members themselves, and made an object of government activity, from a bridge, a schoolhouse, and the communal property of a village community, to the railroads, the national wealth, and the National University of France. Finally, the Parliamentary Republic, in its struggle against the revolution, found itself compelled to strengthen the means and the centralization of governmental power with repressive measures. All revolutions perfected this machine instead of breaking it. The parties, which alternately contended for domination, regarded the possession of this huge state structure as the chief spoils of the victor. Now, that's the section that's commonly cited, and I have a slightly different uh, translation. This is from Postmodern Interpretations of Marx's 18th Romer from 2002. Uh, all upheavals perfected this machinery instead of destroying it. The parties that grappled in turn for power regarded possession of this immense edifice of state uh, um, as the chief booty of the victor. Um, and here's just a little bit more. Regarded the possession of this huge state structure as the chief spoils of the victor. But under the absolute monarchy, during the first revolution, and under Napoleon, the bureaucracy was only the means of preparing the class rule of the bourgeoisie. Under the Restoration, under Louis-Philippe, under the Parliamentary Republic, it was the instrument of the ruling class, however much it strove for power of its own. Only under the Second Bonaparte does the state seem to have made itself completely independent. The state machinery has so strengthened itself vis-a-vis -vis civil society that the chief of the Society of December 10 suffices for its head, an adventurer dropped in from abroad, raised on the shoulders of a drunken soldiery which he bought with whiskey and sausages, and to which he has to keep throwing more sausages. Hence the low-spirited despair, the feeling of monstrous humiliation and degradation that oppresses the breast of France and makes her gasp. She feels dishonored. And yet the state power is not suspended in the air. Bonaparte represented a class, and the most numerous class of French society at that. 
the small holding peasants. Just yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the interesting thing of like, it, it does appear that the state is levitating above all of these, but actually Napoleon did uh, represent a class. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> this is why Lenin later has his famous line, smash the state. Um, you know, recognizing that, that, that the state sort of operates under its own logic, right? This is, this it's not completely untethered from society and, and, and economy. Um, but it's something that as it continues to develop as something that's above and outside of society, and in a lot of ways above and outside of politics, um, it becomes a fundamental threat because who controls the state controls society effectively. And this is why, you know, when we talk about democratic socialism or, you know, some of these theories like theories outlined by Leo Panitch, you know, the state becomes one of the most important sites of struggle, wherein like so much of American socialist thought um, and debate and, and argument is solely about electoral strategy. How can we get somebody to win an election? Right. And then when we have them, are they are they reflecting us and are they saying the things that we want them to say um, when it's like, you know, all that stuff has a place. And I'm not saying that none of it is important, but man, like the real fight would like the real historic fight of th this kind of politics would see itself when you had maybe a parliamentary majority um, and it had to go up against the state apparatus. Right. Um, and one of my biggest frustrations of, of the U.S. left right now is not that they're too radical in a lot of ways i wish we were more radical but rather that like even the radicals are so depressed and demoralized that they don't even consider start to do the work of what a kind of political struggle like that would look like what would it mean to infiltrate the state how does the american state operate who controls the power in, in the system incredibly under theorized underdeveloped um and ignored when in fact like this probably more than anything is like the greatest question because if you've seen time and time again you've had for great strategic reasons maybe accidents of history revolutionary radical pro-worker working class rooted movements come into office and they either fail because the state repels them or they become incorporated in the state as this like the kind of crisis of social democracy and like this is marx i think outlining it very very well um what this this threat can mean even in the context of um struggle between the bourgeoisie and um the state right um which is a very different fight for example than what like a workers movement and the state would happen would have but even in that context there is this kind of there is this conflict right yeah and as he mentions at the end there um napoleon representing foremost the small holding peasants this is the uh the the latter half of the summer here is uh, again to do with his concept of the lumping proletariat and rather than play that entire section um here's just some key quotes but i do think people should go into it just for a very quick historical summary of how that sort of small holding peasant uh the economy oh, we're not going to that. over the sack of potatoes are we i i have that yeah okay. so like the the I, there's a well yeah, yeah. I, here's a few here's a few quotes on the lump and proletariat stuff and you can fill in whichever i uh get rid of but yeah the, the famous quote uh um the small holding and the peasant uh the small holding the peasant and the family alongside them another small holding another farmer and another family a few score of these make a village and a few score of villages make a department uh, this thus the great bulk of the french nation is formed by simple accretion much as potatoes in a sack of potatoes and uh and then he continues um uh the basically goes into explain why they were so conducive to uh, um or so uh ready for ready for bonaparte <laughs> This wasn't ready for Hillary. Um, the, through a historical tradition, it has come to pass that the French peasantry believed in a miracle that a man by, of the name of Napoleon would bring them back into their former glory. And then one other big section just um, further um, on the Lump Proletariat, just a few a paragraph below. But let us be clear about this. Uh, the Bonaparte dynasty does not represent the revolutionary peasants, but rather the conservative ones. Mm -hmm. Not the peasant who reaches beyond his social condition of existence, the small holding, but rather the one who wants to shore it up more firmly. Not the country people who want to overthrow the old order under their own steam in conjunction with their own ta with, with the towns, but rather the uh, exact opposite. Those who are stupidly locked up within the old order and who want to see themselves saved and preferred 
along with their small holdings by means of the ghost of an empire. It represents peasant superstition, not enlightenment, prejudice, not judgment, and the past, not the future. The modern Von D, uh, Royalist Revolt in 1789-94, not the modern Sivan, uh, anti feudal Revolt in 1702 and 05. And um, is there one more section? Um, uh, actually, no, if you want to jump in, David. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the, like a very well um quoted line right that the the peasants make up um yeah the sorry the great mass of the french nation is formed by the simple addition of homogeneous magnitudes much as potatoes in a sack form a sack of potatoes right. and okay so like let's let's break this down what he's saying and what happened right um like also remember these are distinct classes right the, the these these small peasants and the lumpen um, the Lumpen are, are, Napo are, are Bonaparte's shock troops in the city. They are like the, the people who are marching through the streets and, and, and engage, sorry, embedding themselves within the military, um, within all of these other forms. And like these are the ones that in the towns that like he's appealing to by giving them whiskey and sausages. This other group, which is, ends up being the group that votes him into power re regularly um, and ends up being like the class that – Bonaparte probably would not have been able to maintain his electoral victories without this this class of peasants. So right. rather than the proletariat, which as this entire book is about, why did the proletariat not rise um, and take advantage of this crisis to come into power? Um, well, the answer is the proletariat is demobilized, depoliticized, um, while um, the uh, the bourgeoisie is sort of pushed to the sidelines by Bonaparte, and Bonaparte emboldens the lumpen proletariat into the state, and then relies on these kind of conservative and reactionary peasants to support him. So this is the class yeah. matrix here um, that leads to his victory. Now, this sack of potatoes thing, it, it, it needs some breakdown because the way this is always sort of quoted is like Marx is saying that the peasantry is like sort of stupid. They're just like basically the products of their, of their production. They grow potatoes. They are potatoes. Um, I don't think it's accidental that Marx sort of, sort of presents them in a quaint way. Um, but I think a lot of times people miss the metaphor here of thinking of him sort of presenting them as like potato, like as vegetables. Right. Yeah. What he means by this is that there is nothing unifying about the class politics of this um of, of this peasantry in france so Trap. what has to happen something needs to encapsulate them and then hold them to create out of this lump right of, of just lumps and piles of potatoes it creates the sack around them that sort of is able to hold them up and say this is the people right and that is the political project of bonaparte so when marx is calling them a sack of potatoes um I could understand how people could be insulted by that. But what he's talking about is, um, I, again, like, I don't think he's not in trying to insult them. I think there is, like, a little bit of an insult cooked in there. Yeah. But everyone fi fixates on the insult and misses, like, the political point that he's making is that it is Bonaparte who's able to construct the sack that is then able to hold them up. This group of people from all over France who have no communication with one another um, are very isolated individual, small towns, small families. Like from north of France to south of France, this entire country that spans different cultures, peoples, interests, Bonaparte is able to create um, this sack. And of course, he does this by not appealing to the more radical aspects of the countryside. Uh, he uses the word here, I, I want to get it right, um, when he's talking about the, yeah, so we're talking about the peasants when he's saying these are the conservative peasants that he wins. Um, he says, um, the Bonaparte dynasty, dynasty represents not the revolutionary, but the conservative peasant, not the peasant who strikes out beyond the condition of his social existence, right? And what he means by, by here is that, like, in the sense that um, peasantry is reactionary, right? Um, it is because they want to maintain and hold stronger to this primitive mode of, of, of production, this mode yeah. that's becoming more and more outdated. So they are conservative in the sense they are looking back. They want to maintain the old way versus the, the peasant who's able to strike out beyond their condition, um, their present condition, and look towards the future of, of a more egalitarian, more advanced way of living. Um, and I think that's interesting, both like on, on the context of like the, the political makeup of the peasantry, uh, but also something within Marxism that 
I think is really important because oftentimes Marx is solely portrayed as a um, um, as a dogmatist, right? As somebody who says we see the future and it's going right. to happen in this way. He's not literally in this case here. He's even talking about the agency of the peasant, where like everything about their economic and social condition is probably trying to push them towards reaction. But there does exist a revolutionary peasantry who is able to go beyond the condition of their social existence, right? So right. you know, anyways, like that's not as important for the the text and the history here as much as it is also a revelation about how Marx even saw. Um, how much your economic condition determines your political activity, right? It, it plays yeah. a major role in the like the aggregate, um, but there are always going to be these more radical, exceptional exceptions to the rule. Yeah, I mean, all of this stuff the, from the offense to lump and proletariat to like the concern, like, does Marx mean that it has to be the base and super like right? Like mm -hmm. that is just like I think yeah, we're not we haven't been prepared well to. <laughs> <laughs> understand this sort of thing with as opposed to like anything that isn't just like a fundamentalist but one final section that he has on this lump of proletariat thing which i think really kind of goes to like the whole and i i bring this back to 2016 2020 but like the bernie bro um which could be any gender uh any orientation and then on the one hand and the deplorable on the other um uh, but here's what uh, Marx says about the peasants specifically. Uh, Finally, during the Parliamentary Republic, peasants from different parts of France rose up against their own monstrous offspring, the army. The mm -hmm. bourgeoisie punished them with states of siege and foreclosures on property. And this is the bourgeoisie that now whines about the stupidity of the masses, the vile multitude that betrayed it to Bonaparte. It has greatly strengthened the fervor of for empire amongst the peasant class. It, it conserved the conditions which are the breeding ground of this peasant religion. In any case, the bourgeoisie is bound to fear the stupidity of the peasant masses so long as they remain conservative and the insights of the peasantry as soon as they become revolutionary. And I think that is like, that's, that's perfect. Like that you're this con you're the deplorable or you're a Bernie bro. And that's, that's, it, that is like insight versus bigotry, but it's the same. Like that it's why we have this, this whole thing of like the elites and and i mean jenk uger of tyt is like wouldn't it be awesome if the left <laughs> and the right could just come together and fight corruption it's like that would be awesome um but there, <laughs> like, it, but there's like like sort of a long track record that says like that ain't gonna happen yeah yeah and like you know this ends up being the the kind of swan song of of the republic right bonaparte is able to consolidate power using these classes as 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 his the lumpen as his shock troops and uh you know the the peasantry as a kind of electoral wall until he basically is, doesn't even have to worry about that anymore um yeah i mean i i mean I, we're like we're wrapping up to the end i have like some final thoughts in particular on that chank thing um because like basically like what marx then lines out is like this is what happened right why does the worker not rise as we sort of outlined because like the working class is completely demobilized, unorganized, and and politically defeated at this point, um, shot and in debt. At the moments in in French history um, where maybe some kind of alliance could have come together when some something like this could have happened, the bourgeoisie turned their backs on on the workers. Um, so then when they sort of were crying for them, it was way 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 too late. Um, last couple things uh, sections um, that I have here is. Uh, Bonaparte knows how to pose at the same time as a representative of the peasants and the people in general, as a man mm. who wants to make the lower classes happy within the framework of bourgeois society. New decrees cheat the true socialists of their governmental skill in advance. But above all, Bonaparte knows how to pose as the chief of society of December the 10th, right, the lumpen proletariat organization, as the representative of the lumpen proletariat to which he himself, his entourage, his government, and his army belong, and whose main object is to benefit itself and draw California lottery prizes from the state treasury. And he confirms himself as the chief of, uh, of the society of December 10th with decrees, without decrees, and despite decrees. So... Basically, you know, what ends up happening is is um, Bonaparte is able to embody the state, um, both officially and unofficially, um, is able to embody these classes of reaction, the lumpen and the uh, and the um, and the, uh, the the peasantry. 
um, and all the while is able to speak of himself as as a true representative of the people and he'll do things from time to time that sort of are looking out for everyday folks and he's also doing things that embody some of the class interests of the bourgeoisie and the ruling class so he's able to um embody politics in a way that abstracts all of the kind of class divisions in society and give a little bit to you know um francois um fancy ar aristocrat finance bro um, and something to Pierre, um, you know, small peasant, you know, <laughs> growing potatoes somewhere. Um, and yeah. he's able to do this. And again, like this isn't some grand revitalization of, of French imperial power, right? They still engage in, in war and things like this. But um, really what this is, is not some kind of crystallization in, in the sense of what his uncle uh, represented, uh, Napoleon, the little but the big one. Um, right. It's 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 a pure reactionary government that undoes some of the most radical promises of the initial revolution in France, um, and in the service basically of enriching Bonaparte um, and uh, you know the people who surrounded him. Yeah, scams. <laughs> they find a lot of really good scams. Um, was there anything else from the text, or should we just give our final thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, my final thoughts are mainly that I'm excited. I mean, we should double back and do Communist Manifesto yeah. um, for sure. But I'm excited to move on. I actually, like, did some Lenin reading. Um, not yeah. the State and Revolution. I read the State and the Revolution a while ago, but it, Lenin has a lecture on, um, on just the state um, that's much shorter, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to do that um, uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean... Um... Damn it, I had like something really clear in my head a second ago. Um... Well, while you're thinking of that, the only final thing I have to think about is like the sort of like the way the myth of Napoleon appealed to the peasantry. Mm -hmm. That the one final parallel to Trump is all my life I've been hearing this shit about we need a businessman in the <laughs> yeah. White House. Especially from like my grandparents who were enthusiastic yeah. Trump uh, partisans. And like, it's, it's a completely, it's a different myth. It's a different stage of capitalism. I think that we have, like, we've gone from the warrior mm -hmm. or the nephew of a warrior, um, imperialist to a businessman. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it kind of feels like, I don't know. I, I maybe there's a, there's a, no, um, I mean, I think that's like, you know, there's a cultural aspect of it too, right? No longer is yeah. it the handsome generals as Matt Chrisman, uh, you know, would say on, uh, the hell of presidents right yeah and, you know, the handsome general period in american history right we've replaced the handsome general uh first with a bunch of Rhodes scholars right and like you know ivy boys not that they weren't all obvious before but like you know right. the the scrappy aspirational uh, offspring of the middle class to just like a businessman i do think that it's very man. true that there is a that there's a cultural decline represented in that um yeah yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that one, if you didn't read the, the text, you really should, um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of history here that's particular, it can be a little tricky, but, you know, with a little bit of effort, um, you, you can you can catch yourself up on it. Um, but the reason that I, I, I find so much every time we I'm able to return to this text, is that um, it really outlines uh, what a, like a Marxist view of, of, of politics is, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a way that's so much more developed than I think the kind of pop Marxism, right? The pop Marxism is that there's like the rich and the poor, the rich want to hurt the poor, the poor don't want to be hurt by the rich. This therefore like underlines like politics, right? It's a, like in the maybe the most broad zoomed out like 500 year version of history that might be effective. But really what this is, uh, what Marx is able to do here is um, to break down like a, a kind of class analysis, why all these different classes and even splinters within the classes acted in the way that they did. And I think one thing that like really highlights this versus maybe a kind of liberal view of history is where like, because there's a way of looking at this this chapter of like, the ruling classes and the the parliamentary parties in in France sort of lost their way, and they <laughs> like they gave up on the dreams of the revolution and like the, um, the 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 calls for civil liberties and all that, right? And that's true, right? 
But why did that happen? Was it because they sort of like stopped caring and stopped loving these things? No, it was because they came in contradiction with their class interests, right? So rather than, you know, sort of look, um, looking sort of befuddled at history, it's like, why were they saying this thing before? And now they're saying something different as if that came from like a, you know, late night at the salon, right? Where some people sort of changed their, their attitudes. Like, no. The French state represented the power of finance. Finance was attached to the state. There was also a more rambunctious and revolutionary proletariat brewing. To break that power, they had to cl clamp down on all of the glittering promises of the French Revolution, all the promises yeah. of the equality of, of man, all the promises of freedom of, 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 of assembly and speech and all these kind of things. They had to break them because they were threatening their power. They were threatening the very thing that made them who they are, right, which was owning property. So by um, so because of their economic need, they broke with those political promises. Um, and by but by and then of course as you know the tragedy of the story is by breaking with those those political promises, they undid themselves and their own power. Um, but like that kind of view of history is something that is so much richer than uh, like a more liberal version of it, which is just like, oh, you know, a lot of people just had bad ideas during this period of time. Like we didn't argue, they didn't argue hard enough, right? No, like these things were going to come into contradiction because there is an inherent contradiction between the flowery promises of like a liberal bourgeois revolution and the need to maintain capitalism, which is a system that denies all of those things to everyday working people, right? And it's that fundamental contradiction that ends up creating this kind of history you know and it could have gone a different way and this is the thing too that mark sort of lies out was like you know there might have been a potential here or there for like a working class movement to maybe take power but they were lulled to sleep they were demobilized they were outmaneuvered um they had phantoms like that that's like the psychological thing like it's not just that proves marx isn't just like a this is all written sort of thing right mm -hmm. like if he he literally mentions this entire thing of like the imagination and the play acting of it and the performance of it <laughs> yeah. no 100 percent. and um you know if anything though um in the bonaparte's success by giving out cold poultry and sausages uh, reifies our commitment to building barbecue socials. <laughs> you gotta be giving that kind of stuff out to people. Um, yeah. but I mean, this has been a lot of fun. It was pretty ambitious, but I'm happy we were able to do it. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Um, uh, tell your friends that we've been doing these things behind the paywall. Um, and maybe get some of some folks to check this out. You know, this is, uh, I would have loved to have been able to listen to something like this when I was sort of working through, uh, these texts mm. on my own. Um, yeah. But folks, uh, unless you have anything to add, uh, that's it. 18th Actually, I do. Yeah. I want to ask you one more question. I know we've gone long, but do you think Engels overstated the systematicity or formulaic? Um, the, like, because Marx himself doesn't say historical materialism mm -hmm. here. And um, I'm all for a, a very, like, um, rigid um, approach. But this is not really that. Is it? I, I think Engels, I think Engels more than anyone in the canon. And I think a lot of that actually has to do with like what happened when it sort of went beyond them. No, I, I 100% agree that I think Engels more than anybody contributed to the dogma, to, like the con conception of Marx as like a very strict um, right. you know, dogmatist. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because I, and I think that's like one thing like Americans, like you just see, I, you know, in the North Dakota socialism documentaries, you, it, they talked about like the farmers in the 1910s being like, Look, don't push these foreign you yeah. know, mumbo jumbo formulas onto me, right? Like, but like that's not really what it's about. Like, it's mm -hmm. more about a dynamic and lively like engagement with the world. And like, whether like, and people get so tied up on like the like fundamental definitions, but like you can still say something meaningful about something, even though like that term, like you can say LeBron James is a basketball player. He's also a father. He's also a lot of yeah. things, right? But you can still say something meaningful by using that type type of language. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. And like, um, you know, if anything, for folks who might not have experience reading Marx more in the long form, I, you know, I hope that this gives that that sense is like, this is an incredibly dynamic uh, philosophy that, that is able to point to a lot of truth. It's very helpful, um, you know, looking at things, you know, back to front. Um, you know, but being able to look at these tools, like, you know, where are these fissures in American politics right now? I mean, yeah, yeah if anything, that's a challenge, right? Take some of these concepts 
that you know Marx is developing here, and like look at American capital, right? Look at the American yeah. capitalist class. You know, I think it's I think some of the more Marxist work in looking at the split right now between certain parts of the capitalist class and which political party they're, they're supporting. It's clear that capital is not united between right. under one banner um, anymore. Um, and why why do certain sections of of capital prefer the Republican Party and why do others prefer the Democratic Party? I think these are like really important lines of inquiry if you want yeah. to build a politics that can win. Right. That reminds me of one thing I wanted to say and how I'm going to sell this is like, hey, you know, that whole like line that's coming from, I'd say, like libertarians mm -hmm. um, about the uniparty. And it's like, I don't <laughs> think that's I don't think that's super helpful, guys. No, I think it's there's not. probably better ways to think about this. I mean, look at what happens here when you try to hold a bunch of, uh, you know, contradictory class interests under one banner. <laughs> Bonaparte yeah. is able to just run circles around them. Um, no, I mean, God, one of the worst developments ever would be to do uh, like the left populist and the right populist unity, right? Um, these are very, very different conceptions of, of, of politics um, and, and class interests um, that it's it's very naive, honestly, to continue yeah. pushing that fantasy. All right, guys. Well, we will be back with you on a Tuesday. Thank you, David. And uh, man, this was fun. Yeah. See you all soon.